Good evening, y'all. Good evening to everybody. I want to welcome you to Greater Hope Church tonight for our 5 o'clock service. We're glad that you're here with us. Uh, whether you're here in person or joining us online, we want to welcome you. Uh, if you didn't get a bulletin, please uh, go ahead and grab one or just wave your hand and somebody will bring you one. If you're watching online, uh, the, the uh, homepage of our website has a link to the bulletin for tonight. Uh, we are going to begin our worship by singing from the hymnal. If you'll grab the red hymnal in front of you uh, and go to number 16, hymn number 16, we're going to be singing. This is a, a version or a setting of Psalm 98. It's called, Come, Let Us Sing Unto the Lord. Um, let's stand and sing. Please stand. seated. Our call to worship tonight comes from Psalm 147. If you'll uh, follow along with me as I read it from the bulletin. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of their stars. He gives to all them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Let's pray together. Well, God, tonight we are in awe of just the, the blending and the harmony of your various attributes as we read it here in Psalm 147. That you're the one who builds up Jerusalem, the one who numbers the stars, the one who gives each of the stars their name. 
when there are so many that we can't even count them ourselves. And yet you're also the one that gathers the outcast and heals the wounds of the brokenhearted. You're abundant in power and yet the lifter of the humble. God, we're amazed at who you are. We confess that so often we, when we just get a little bit of power, we use it uh, for ourselves. We use it to take advantage. We use it to lord it over others rather than, like you, use your power to serve. Yes, to bring honor and glory to your name, but to do so in a way that is for your creation's highest good. We worship you, God. We long tonight to know you more. We're gathered tonight because we're hungry to know more about you. And so we pray, God, that as we worship and as we go to our classes and study your word, that you would open it up to us. Help us to mine it of its various treasures and to store up those treasures in our hearts so that through this week, not only would we not sin against you, but God, we would run to you with gladness, that we would prize you above all other things. And that we would keep our gaze fixed on our heavenly home. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Galatians 3.29 says this, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Let's stand together and praise our God, the God of Abraham. As we sing about his sovereignty over us, you can find the words printed in the bulletin. Let's stand together as we sing. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. you meet us in the morning with a love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood faithful forever perfect in love you are so
and for your glory even in the valley you are faithful you're working for our good you are working for our good for your glory even what the enemy means for evil you turn it for our good you turn seated. If you could find the uh, hymnal in front of you again and turn to page 871, we're going to continue to confess our way through the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Tonight, uh, question 28. If you don't know, uh, our students on Sunday nights have been uh, studying through the Westminster Shorter Catechism with Tim Brown, uh, and a few of the other dads have gone in there as well to teach, uh, and our kids learn on Sunday nights a younger version of the Shorter Catechism, kind of like a pre-catechism. And so one of the themes on Sunday nights here is catechizing. Uh, catechizing means teaching. Um, that, that's a, just a Greek word from the New Testament that just means to learn how to echo, to learn how to respond with the answer that God has revealed in the Word to the various questions of life. And so here in question 28, we're asking again about Jesus' work. What does it mean that Jesus is exalted? What does it mean that he is exalted? Wherein consisteth Christ's exaltation? Christ's exaltation consisteth in his rising again from the dead on the third day, in ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Very good. Sometimes the uh, older English gets you tongue-tied there. Consisteth. I had a hard time with that this evening. So. Let's pray together uh, as we think about Jesus exalted on high right now and interceding for us ceaselessly before the throne. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do worship you tonight for your infinite wisdom. You, O oh Lord, are the all-knowing God. You are wise in all of your counsels, in all of your works. You've never had anyone um, that you've needed to teach you anything or to give you counsel, but you yourself are the wonderful counselor, the source of all truth and the source of all wisdom. We praise you tonight for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, and that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Before the world was made, Lord, you delighted in your Son, and your Son delighted in you. Together with the Holy Spirit, you brought into being everything in this world, all that your eternal counsel had determined to create. You are worthy of praise, Lord, and you're worthy of the total devotion of our lives. But in order to live for you, God, we need wisdom. Tonight, we take refuge in that verse that says, when anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, because God gives to all liberally without reproach. And so, God, we come to you admitting that we don't have wisdom in ourselves. We need you to put wisdom in our hearts. Let your word be the unfolding of light to us. May we walk not in the counsel of the wicked, but meditate in your word without ceasing so that we can bear fruit for you. 
Tonight, forgive our foolishness, God, especially for the ways we've thought or spoken or lived as if you didn't even exist. We've put ourselves and we've put other things in your place time and again. Please have mercy, Lord. We ask that good counsel would go forth from our lips every day, from the, the lips of this church every day to the people in the community around us. We pray, Lord, for those in our community that lack direction, for those who are addicted, for those who are in conflict and in bitterness, for those who are caught in the snare of Satan, for the brokenhearted, for those walking blindly in the darkness of selfishness and sin. Lord, may the word that proceeds from your mouth give hope to all. And may we, your church, we, your people, be carriers of that light. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name and all God's people said, Amen. All right, before our scripture reading, our kids are dismissed for their class. Uh, this is all kids up to fifth grade, right here to my right hand side. And then. Students from 6th to 12th grade can go to the back door. All right, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25 tonight as we continue to work through this book. Uh, we are now in the section of the book about Isaac, Abraham's son. But we're going to hear a little bit more about Abraham tonight, uh, mixed in with some about Isaac. Because here in chapter 25, Abraham dies. And Isaac and his uh, other sons uh, not only bury Abraham, but Abraham ensures before he dies that the inheritance is going to come down to the right person. Uh, who in this case is Isaac. And then we're going to read a little bit about how Isaac himself grew up and began to uh, start his own family. So I want to read uh, the ver 28 verses of uh, chapter 25. If you would follow along with me, this is the word of the Lord. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimron, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and Leumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephur, Hanak, Adid, Abida, and Eldah. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with, his, with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled in Beer Laharoi. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Abdeel, and Mibsam, uh, Mibsam. And Kedemah, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt, in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. 
And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The, the one shall be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Word of the Lord. All right. Well, there's a lot of names in there, uh, but there's some, I think, very important meaning in all the names and really in all the sections of this passage, and I think the best way to go about it, I want to talk to you tonight about the inheritance. Uh, it's pretty well known that throughout the uh, New Testament, the salvation that we receive in Christ is referred to as an inheritance quite often, and we are referred to as heirs of God. Now, let me point out a few of those places. Uh, first, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, somebody look at Ephesians 1, 11, and I'll have one of you read it out loud real quick. Ephesians 1, 11. Sword drill. Do y'all know what that is? Okay. <laughs> How fast can you get there? Yep. Who can get there fastest? Sword drill. It's cheesy. It's okay if you don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ephesians 1.11. Everybody got it? Go ahead, Stacy. Really? Well that's, well, that's the rules. If you get there first, you got to read it. <laughs> 1 11, yeah. Good. So we were in Christ predestined to receive an inheritance from God. That's, that's a big deal. Uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 to 17. Somebody just start reading it when you get it. <laughs> good so the spirit is given to us so that we might be heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Jesus so it's like we're brothers and sisters of Jesus inheriting the blessing that Jesus deserves from the father one last one we've already read it I'll save you some time getting there it's in your bulletin under the assurance of pardon or the uh, testimony of grace uh, Galatians three twenty nine. somebody read that And that one's sort of even more important to what we're reading tonight because it says in Christ, not only are we God's heirs, but we are connected to Abraham. Therefore, we receive the promise given to Abraham. So it's like we are children of God like Isaac was a children of Abraham. And so this story in uh, Genesis 25, I think, can open up a lot of avenues for us to think about our salvation in Christ. Uh, we are adopted as children into God's family. We receive the inheritance. And we are also called to pass on that inheritance. Just like Abraham, as a believer in God, was called to pass on the inheritance of faith to his sons and their sons after them to their sons and so on down the line all the way till us. All right? There are four things about an inheritance in this story that I want to point out to you. And I'll try to make some correlation to our salvation in Christ for each one. First of all, an inheritance is valuable. Secondly, an inheritance is not earned by the recipient. Third, an inheritance is for the generations. And lastly, an inheritance is given according to a plan that was already set, was already conceived. Make sense? 
Let's go to the first one. Inheritance is valuable. You don't pass down things that aren't valuable. Or well, maybe you do sometimes, but it's not, people aren't excited about it if it's not valuable, especially if it's negative value. To receive someone's debts, for example, is that, would you call that an inheritance? Not really, right? An inheritance, to be an inheritance has to be something that gets you into the positive figures, you know, something that is substantial enough to be passed on and received and respected once it's received. Well, if you look there at those first verses where all the names are being listed, a lot is going on in Abraham's family. I think we'll all agree, Abraham, this is a great example of how he was not a perfect man. Uh, he did not live his family life in the ideal way that God designed it to be because Abraham had multiple women with which he was engaged and he became a father through multiple women. Now, some of them probably were married after Sarah died. I think that's probably true of Keturah there in verse 1. Uh, after Sarah died, he married another woman named Keturah. But, of course, it mentions there Hagar. We know that story. She had been joined to Abraham while Sarah was alive. And then it kind of gives this mention a little bit later on of Abraham's concubines, uh, which is even less savory an arrangement, but one that was nevertheless... Uh, very common during the ancient Near East, uh, where men would father children with women that weren't even their wives, but yet they were in some way committed to them, maybe like a half-wife. Uh, and it sounds terrible, but that's, this is the way they did it. I'm, you know. And of course, we don't approve of that. And the reason why we don't approve of that is because the Bible does not approve of that. It's important to note, later in the, New, in the Old Testament, God makes rules about this and says you really should only have one wife. If it so happens that you have more than one, you better treat them all like your wives. You can't treat them lesser than the other. You can't set them up as rivals. Well, of course, good luck with that, right? Which is why overall, uh, God says don't do that. One wife, one man, one woman, for life. That's the Genesis 1 definition of marriage. Abraham's got a less than Genesis 1 family. And yet, it's very clear, isn't it? Abraham knows what his marching orders are based on the promise of God in terms of where he's passing his inheritance. Did you notice that? Who does he give everything to? Isaac, verse 5. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. Now, it's not that he didn't bless his other sons and daughters. It tells us in verse 6 that he gave gifts to them, but he gave gifts while he was sending them away. Right? The same thing with Ishmael. He blessed Ishmael, and we learn that God continues to bless Ishmael, even as God had promised to Hagar, his mother. But he sent Ishmael away, along with Hagar, his mother, because it was only Isaac uh, who was going to inherit the promise that God had given to Abraham, which was to have a multitude of nations come from your offspring and to possess this land from which you were one day going to become a light to all the nations. In your offspring, Abraham, all the families of the world are going to be blessed. That got passed on to Isaac and to Isaac alone because Isaac was the son of promise. He was not the son of Abraham's sin. He was not the son of Abraham's scheming like some of the other sons and daughters were. He was the son of God's miraculous power in Sarah's womb and in Abraham's body. And therefore, he was going to be the one to receive the blessing with a capital B, the inheritance with a capital I. Now, this is important because we as parents, we as uh, Christians who have children or grandchildren, have to think about this. There's a lot of things that we can pass on to our kids, and they're good things. There's a lot of things that we can bless them with, and they are great blessings. But this is teaching us, and the whole Bible is going to follow in line and teach us the same thing. The number one thing that we ought to be really praying and concerned about trying to pass on is God's inheritance. Right? The covenant of grace. Uh, the, the things that God has promised his people and given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we can't make our children believe. We can't make our children respond the way we want them to respond, especially not in the timing we want them to respond in, because that's, God, that's in God's hand. All of it's in God's hand. 
But there is a responsibility that we have uh, as parents and, and even grandparents and even as an extended family in the church as we're helping parent one another's children in a way. We have this responsibility to ensure that the first thing we're trying to do is give them Jesus and to give them the many blessings that we just read about in Ephesians 1, Romans 8, Galatians 3, the blessing of an inheritance in heaven, an inheritance that doesn't spoil and doesn't fade. Remember what Jesus said? The things on this earth will get destroyed by moth and rust and thieves. Isn't that right? The things in heaven, though, untouchable by all those things. Moth doesn't eat in heaven. Thieves don't steal in heaven. Rust doesn't destroy in heaven. And so the, the number one thing that Abraham is concerned about is making sure that Isaac gets the God promise, the faith promise. And I have to ask myself a lot as a parent, is that what I'm trying to do? You know, is that what I'm trying to do? Uh, it's easy to get caught up in the blocking and tackling of parenting, which is just trying to get your kids to behave halfway decent, you know, <laughs> keeping them clothed, fed, um, you know, basically hygienic, you know, <laughs> making sure they get the bath and sort of brush their teeth in the way that they do, uh, get them to school, get them the education so that they can get off on their own. And all those things are beautiful goals, of course. And they, they consume a lot of time, don't they, of parents. So much time that sometimes we can almost let days and days go by without thinking about, have I prayed with my children? Uh, have, I, have I spent any opportunity helping my children see how Jesus impacts the various things they're going through in their lives? Or have I just simply approached it from a basically worldly perspective, which is just not bad, but just common sense rather than Jesus sense? I mean, still give them the common sense, don't get me wrong. But give them the Jesus sense as well. And of course, order, in order to have that, we got to be well skilled in the Jesus sense. Uh, Abraham was. Now, a Abraham was a man of many flaws, but he knew this one thing. God had promised him something amazing, and he delivered on the promise. And he's going to make sure that none of those other children were going to be able to discourage Isaac from clinging to what God had promised him. And so there you have it. Verse 5, he gave all that he had. Something very, very valuable was given. What are some of the things that y'all find distracting as parents or grandparents? Distracting from the main task of passing Jesus on to your kids. Extracurricular activities. There you go. Extracurricular activities. Man, they're time consuming, aren't they? Especially when you got multiple kids, you're shuttling one here, one there, and you're dividing and conquering. It can be very just wearisome. Good, but wearisome. What else? Influences from outside sources. There you go. Yeah. Influences from outside sources. Um, especially once they reach a certain age, you know, the outside voices, you know, have a pretty big, much bigger voice than you do. <laughs> They're cooler and, and more with it than you are once they reach a certain age. And so that's something you always got to be aware of, and you always got to try to counteract. What else? Disney movies. Disney movies, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Just, it, and it stands for kind of all media, right? Where, where media has this message. And, you know, it's not a necessarily always a united message. You can get all different kinds of messages in media, but... A lot of the message has this in common. It's basically kind of godless. And, and that's the bad part. That's the sad thing. It's secular, meaning it's sort of scrubbed of any reference, a real reference, reverent reference to God. And that can, that's like an acid, I think. Um, in my own heart, it's an acid. I don't know if you even notice about yourself, but it can eat away like an acid at your faith because you're just constantly immersed in a, in a place that just doesn't regard God as being real or, or being relevant or something to, someone to be respected. Uh, Abraham faced all this. You know, he knew all this was, was going on, which is probably one of the reasons why he gave the gifts to the other children while sending them away <laughs> because he wanted to make sure Isaac stayed focused and stayed unimpeded by the other 
voices and the other influences that he might have in his life. Uh, Abraham probably knew it by experience because he had lived in a pagan society for many years. He grew up in one, unlike his son Isaac. And so he was especially zealous to guard his son from what he had experienced growing up. Uh, we always have to ask ourselves, what do we value most? What are we teaching our kids to value most? The most valuable thing is the inheritance that God alone can give to somebody. Eternal life, forgiveness of sins. The Holy Spirit, Christ-likeness, assurance of God's love, joy in the Holy Spirit, peace of conscience. I mean, th th those are things you just can't, money can't buy them. And, and you can't make your kids get them and embrace them. But you can encourage it. Uh, and you can pray that God would water and make grow the seeds that you plant. All right? And inheritance is valuable. But secondly... An inheritance is not earned by the recipient. Uh, Abraham knew this very well. Uh, let's think about it. H how did Abraham know that he was an heir of God, but it was not by his works? He was given it. How? All the wealth that he had was a, a gift. I mean, it, you know, God had made him wealthy through various means. But even the spiritual blessing that he had came by grace, right? Remember, God came and called him while he was still in a pagan land. He was in Ur of the Chaldeans. God called him, come with me, Abraham. Where do you want me to go, God? Come with me and I'll show you. Abraham went. Uh, God began to promise Abraham a child. Remember how many years it was that Abraham had to wait for that child? How many was it? 25. Quarter of a century. He waited. He waited. He waited. And when the child came, it was so clear, wasn't it, that it wasn't Abraham that produced the child. It wasn't Sarah that produced the child. It was God's miracle. Abraham was 100. Sarah was 90. Which, yeah, when you live to be 175, it's not as old as it is today to be 100. However, it's still pretty old. Maybe somebody can do the mental math there on what, what would 100 be in today's terminology. Still past childbearing years. I guarantee you that. Um, even if it's like 70. 70 year old people don't have babies, right? And so Abraham understood this is grace, this is grace. Now Isaac is going to come to understand that too. Uh, look at what it says starting in verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Uh, Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, of Aramean, of Petamaram, the sister of Laban, to be his wife. And Isaac, it says, prayed to the Lord for his wife because she too was barren. Now already, you know, you're going to start to see this. God has a thing for working with barren women in the Bible. It's just a thing. It is a constant, repetitious story that happens over and over again. Um, miraculous births. Why do you think that is? Why does he always choose to make either, either a barren woman has a child or a virgin, in the case of Mary, has a child? Why? And people can't take credit for that. God is not, he's not trying to share credit with anybody. He wants to show that the redemption of his world is because of his grace, not because of anyone earning it. And a great way to do that is to have that grace passed down through children that are born by miracle. And here's one example of that. Just like his dad before him, he has to pray with and for his barren wife. And it says there, halfway through verse 21, the Lord granted his prayer, just like he did with Abraham. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, Abra um, Isaac, it says, was how old when he married Rebekah? 40, that's verse 20. How old does it say he was when the twins were born? 60. How long did Isaac wait for his children? 20 years of prayer. This is going back again to our sermon this morning, right? How long do you have to wait on God? How long are you willing to pray for something? Uh, Abraham prayed 25 years. 
Isaac prayed 20 years alongside Rebekah. And finally, God did it. God opened her womb. She conceived and bore children. And Isaac wasn't young. Rebekah wasn't young when it happened. Once again, underline the fact that this is God. This is not people doing it. This is not based on works, but it's based on grace. That's the thing about inheritance. You never earn an inheritance. That's the definition of an inheritance. It's not the same thing as a paycheck. An inheritance is given just because someone wanted to give it to you. And they decided to give it to you before they passed away. And when they passed away, here it comes. A gift. Grace. Not works. Which makes all the difference in the world. Uh, The Bible makes it clear. Somebody who believes that they stand with God on the basis of their works is going to be a radically different kind of person than the person who thinks and knows that they stand before God on the basis of his grace. You can't. There is, no, there is no combining those two points of view. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says it's like trying to put oil and water together. You can't put grace and works together. Uh, you either have it's one or the other. Uh, which is why Paul is, you know, in the New Testament gets so heated. I mean, he gets mad in Galatians, that, that book, because, you know, the, the Galatian Christians are trying to um, see one particular work that they do as part of the reason why they're saved, being circumcised. And Paul gets mad about it because he says, even if you think that's the only work you did to get saved, once you get circumcised to get saved, now you have to keep every one of God's commandments in order to get saved. Because you've introduced into your heart a principle of works that simply can leave no room for grace. It's either all works or all grace. You can't have a habsies. You can't have a combination. Right? Um, Let me tell you a couple of, of examples of this. Uh, one from the Bible, and then one from a movie. Bible first. Uh, The parable of the prodigal son. Two sons, far from the father's heart. One of them, in the end, ends up loving his father and serving his father out of love. And it's not the one you would have thought. Which one loves and serves his father out of love? The scallywag, right? The terrible guy, the one who blows the inheritance, the one who hates his dad. But yet because that son was brought to the end of himself and realized that his father was radically gracious, he swore his whole allegiance to him. The older son who thought, I've done all this stuff. Father, I've done everything you told me to do. And you have never blessed me like you blessed that trash that guy was still far away from the father's heart when the story ended (laughs) and the whole bible really teaches us this if we if we approach god as if we could earn our way to heaven by our works we will end up self-righteous ungrateful and unloving. And the church has always had some people in it like that. Older brothers, older sisters, who just don't get grace very well. They haven't come to recognize the way God saves people. They still think it's by works. And I'm going to tell you, there's one thing as, as a preacher that is a marvel to me. Because you can talk to, you could preach a whole sermon about grace. And still have, I'm not saying anybody in here has ever done this, but I've had this happen. You can still have someone come up to you and, you know, they say, I love the sermon. Okay, great. You know, what'd you like about it? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad, you know, that I, I feel like my good deeds have outweighed my bad deeds. And, you know, I'm glad I'm going to go to heaven. I mean, people, it's so stubborn, this works thing. You really can't talk it out of somebody. You can't. Uh, God has to take it out of you. <laughs> uh, it's that deeply rooted in. It's very profound to think about it that way. Here's my movie example. Chariots of Fire. I love the movie. It's, it's an old one, but a good one. 
It's true, based on a true story. Eric Liddell, you know, or Eric Little, however you say it, uh, this Scottish runner from the Olympics, you're probably familiar with the story, um, ran, runs alongside another member of the United Kingdom team, the Great Britain, Britain team, named Harold Abrams. And the movie brings out this dueling sort of reason for why they do what they do. Uh, Harold Abrams says this, and, and he's just the whole time this depressed person, you know, just very discouraged all the time. And he says, I run because when that gun goes off, I have 30 seconds to justify my existence. Whew. That's a lot to put on 30 seconds. Especially 30 seconds of running. That's a lot to put on that. But yet, that, isn't that the way many people live their lives? I'm living to justify my existence. Eric Little, from a different universe, says, I run because I think God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. You see the difference? Abraham was one of the first people to really grasp that difference. And he was charged with passing that difference on to Isaac, who was charged to pass it on to Jacob, and so on and so forth, all the way until you get to Christ. And the New Testament is full of an explanation of the lives of the patriarchs, that they were men and women who lived by grace. They lived for the pleasure of God because they believed that God had without any deserving on their part, given them radical riches spiritually. No deserving. In fact, they believed they were ill-deserving, which is different than being undeserving. And you, this is important, right? Um, I don't believe I'm just undeserving of God's inheritance. I am positively ill-deserving. I deserve the opposite of God's inheritance. Hell. And instead of hell, God gives me the inheritance as a son. Wow. I don't do anything to justify my existence. He has justified me through his gracious gift. Now all that's left is for me to live for his pleasure. And so Abraham passes it on to Isaac, and Isaac, through this 20 years of waiting on God and praying and pleading with God to give him a son, finally God does. He's learning that same principle. I don't live by works. I live by grace. It's not me trying to justify my existence. It's me receiving a gift that I did not deserve. Amen? Now, third, an inheritance, obviously, is for the generations. An inheritance is not only valuable, it's not only a gift, but it's also for being passed on, or it wouldn't be called an inheritance. If you weren't trying to pass it on to the next generation, you would not call it an inheritance. This is important. Uh, look at verses 22 and 23. Uh, the children struggled together within Rebekah. You know, something was going on during her pregnancy where she was just unsettled, and she felt a struggle between the two Twins, And so she said to God, God, if it's this way, why is this happening to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Uh, high drama was going on in Rebecca's womb. This big, you know, epic struggle. <laughs> A struggle that... As you continue to read Genesis, you see play out between Esau and Jacob. But notice what God says is the main purpose of the struggle. The main purpose of the struggle is determining who of the two sons, if both of them or just one of them, are going to really embrace the promise coming down from them. Right? The whole point of Genesis, in a way, is who will inherit? Who is going to get it next? Will it get passed on? Will it go down to the next generation? And, and you know, I, I'm impressed by this. It's not something that I think as American Christians we think about enough. We tend to think of Christianity very individualistically. 
It's as if each person is starting from scratch, blank, blank slate, just me and Jesus. Let me figure this out between me and Jesus. We don't tend to think about what are we doing today to help three generations from now follow Jesus. Like We don't think about that at all, really. And yet, when you read the Bible, that's all that any of the people are thinking about. It always strikes me as something that we need to do better at uh, because there are some things that in order for it to work, they just have to be generational, right? Uh, think about it. If you're trying to plant a forest, can you do that? Just you, starting from scratch today from blank ground. Can you go plant a forest, Bob, a beautiful redwood forest? Just not enough time. Not enough time. That's a great way to put it. This is where I think maybe we don't think soberly in the modern world. There are some things that God's trying to get done in the world that there's just not enough time for us to do. And so we're just one link in a chain. Receiving something that we didn't make, that just got passed to us, sometimes we discount that. We think we just discovered Christianity all on our own. Boom. That's never the way it happens. We always, we're, we're Christians in large part because people before us were Christians and they passed it down. Might not have been your parents, but somebody passed it down. I mean, even the fact that we got this thing, there was a lot of people who before us copied this thing and published this thing and kept on reading this thing and passing it on and teaching it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. And part of being a Christian, part of being a disciple of Jesus is knowing how to receive it from, from the former generations in such a way that we're, we're positioning it to be passed to the next one and the next one and the next one. Not just thinking about our kids, but thinking about their kids and their kids and their kids. And yes, Jesus is going to come back and we hope he does soon, right? But until then, God has a plan for the generations. And we can't bank on the fact that Jesus is going to come back within our generation. Because he might not. There may be many more generations to come. We have to learn how to live that way rather than thinking, well, they'll figure it out like we did. They'll just start over from scratch like we did. It doesn't usually work very well. Have you ever thought about this? What does it take to pass something on in such a way that it is able to be passed on by the people you're passing it on to? which is then able to be passed on by the people that passed it on to them. I mean, what does it take to think generationally? Do we even know anymore what that takes? That, that's not a, it's an actual question. I don't know if we know. Do you think we know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, how many times was he able to say, Rebecca, we got to keep praying? It's not over yet. It's not over yet. And there was this one time that dad pulled out a knife and raised it over me. It was weird. But even then, it wasn't over. You know, God provided. There was a ram in the thicket. I mean, imagine just all the things that Isaac had. But then, not only that, flip to the Flip to the back of the book, and 2,000 years later, the people are still talking about Isaac. And they're still talking about Abraham. And Paul still says, if you're a Christian, here's what's happened to you. You have become Abraham's children, heirs according to the promise. God is building a forest. And, and we live in that forest. And that forest wasn't planted yesterday. It was planted on day one of creation. Right? And we're such recipients of, of the blessing of being able to live in a several thousand year old forest. Full of so much treasure, so much riches that we didn't, we didn't come up with it. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We, we think we're a lot more brilliant than we are, don't we? 
you know, that whole thing of you stand on the shoulders of giants. It's actually really true. Uh, we, we do. And um, I don't know. Lately, I, I've just thought a lot about this, just how we got to think generationally. Like, you know, even as a church, you know, we want to think about greater hope when our great-grandchildren are going here. You know? What does it take to build a greater hope that will be a strong church when they're coming up and raising their children? I don't think I know the answer fully, but let's think about it. Let's pray about it. Let's, let's imagine what that might be, and let's get to work uh, because it's a very important part of discipleship. Um, any thoughts about that? Interesting, isn't it? They do. Um, we do. Yeah. And not that you know, and I think other generations have had as well. But sure. now with our medical advances and just daily, mm-hmm. you know, the need sometimes just to go on things that for them go on. Yeah. And we have to be able to accept the fact that we are not going to be here. Mm-hmm. That's right. To be able to make that work. Exactly. And you know, yeah. Again, people always struggle with death, right? Yeah. But yes very different today and when you look at the way the people in the bible acted at death there's just a radical difference and and there are still uh, saints don't get me wrong in the church who are facing death with the same kind of heroics for sure and we all hope to be those kind of saints when it comes to our dying day and that's part of why we're here on sunday to work on that to get ready to die to die well you know Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? And that's what we want to think about. Yeah. That's cool. And there were people 130 years ago who were probably praying about today in that church. And, um, yeah. And there are churches around the world that are very, very old. And, you know, and even though individual churches may come and go, the church is extremely old. I mean, back to Adam and Eve and... And God has been working down through time. Uh, maybe something you said, Kim, prompted something in me and um, that we can't think selfishly. And I think this is part of the tonic of the Bible to ease our selfishness, to cure us of it. History is about God. <laughs> Your life is just part of history, which is about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. Uh, We're a part of a story God is unfolding, which is for his glory. And that actually used to be the main thing that Christians believed, (laughs) right? Uh, That was like the number one, the first thing. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Somewhere along the way, we began to harmonize Christianity with this idea of self-fulfillment that God is there to fulfill us. What is God's chief end? To glorify me and enjoy me forever. And we would never say that, but yet that is how a lot of people and churches operate, as if God's chief end is to glorify me and enjoy me forever. And that is not true in any universe. (laughs) And there's a tonic for our selfishness in that right there. Yeah, it's hard to pass on things that are splintering constantly. Yeah, very true. It's like a forest where you cut down half the trees every generation. It's really hard to get the momentum going. Yeah. All right. Well, we got one more thing here, and um, I can hear the kids coming. So we're going to talk about this last one next week because it's a big one. An inheritance is passed on according to a plan, and it's perfect to talk about next week because... The next story also deals with the same theme. And uh, 
what we're going to be talking about there is how God's election works down the generations. And salvation comes by election, by God's choice of us from before the foundation of the world. And so it's a heavy topic, but it's a very important one. And it's another one of those tonics against our very selfish way of thinking. Uh, life's about God. And the inheritance we have is his inheritance given to us to be passed down. Great stuff to think about. I hope you've been encouraged, as I have been encouraged, to think about that this week. Uh, let's pray together, and then we're going to end today uh, with a song. Father, thank you for uh, tonight. Thank you for this story about Abraham's death and the way that the inheritance was passed from him to Isaac and from Isaac uh, to Jacob. And Lord, I pray that you would humble us, Lord. Help us to see that we're but creatures of a moment, and um, our, our lives are like vapor and breath and all the various ways the Bible describes it. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to know that you're bigger than our days and that when we're dead, you're still going to take what you're doing and pass it down and down and down and down. And Lord, praise be your name. Holy is your name. Please be honored by our life in this generation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a song um, about God's inheritance and his election of us to receive that inheritance in Christ. You can find this hymn on page 469, How Sweet and Awesome is the Place. Let's stand while we sing. faith is in Christ, go tonight in this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. Go in his hope tonight. Let's follow Jesus for the generations. Amen. Thanks for being with us.